Yeah, I just should say, I, I, I haven't wet myself, but my wife kindly poured my drink <laughs> over me. <laughs> just to make sure I was up for this. <laughs> so, yeah, well, thanks for the invitation to come here. It's, uh, it's nice to be back on this island after 25 years, and uh, I'm looking forward to 2020. <laughs> and maybe you'll get there before then. So, yeah, I thought it would be interesting to talk about cannabis. I, uh, it's a topic that uh, I've done a lot of thinking about over the years. In fact, I've done so much thinking about it that it got me sacked. Um, so here is uh, my sacking as, uh, from the, my position as the UK drug czar. Um, and, of course, you can see the book of cannabis falling from my hand as Alan Johnson, uh, the Home Secretary's hand, shut me up. But, of course, um, like most politicians, he didn't realise, he didn't have much common sense, and he didn't understand the fact that, actually, the worst thing you can do to someone, particularly someone like me, is to um, give them a, a reason to be angry. So, uh, <laughs> instead of shutting me up, the debate has now increased probably tenfold, and it's become extremely public. And uh, the, the argument I was making is very well summed up by the bottom of the cartoon. You see the, the scales of justice on one side, you see beer and fags, and on the other side, you see green things in um, plastic bags. And I was arguing that beer and fags really are the main health problem in the, in the UK today. And that the fixation we have on novel drugs and also old drugs like cannabis is actually a deliberate ploy to avoid confronting the real problem. And it's a ploy that has political ramifications. It also has a lot of economic ramifications because to some extent it's driven by the drinks and tobacco industry as well. So I essentially said cannabis is less harmful than alcohol, and that was uh, something the government didn't want to hear, so they sacked me. <laughs> but the good thing is, I now know I was right, because <laughs> President Obama has made it very clear that, that in fact, uh, <laughs> cannabis is less harmful than alcohol. He said this last year. Now, this was truly, this is, this is one of the most remarkable statements an American president has ever made. It, it's the only time I know that an American president has ever told the truth about drugs. So in its, uh, that sense, it is truly a truly landmark statement. He, he made it, though. The reason he made this statement was to stop a civil war breaking out. Be, in the USA, as you probably know, a lot of states, 21 now, I think, have made cannabis available as a medicine and three now have made it legal as a, as a recreational drug. But it's the medical cannabis which is really important. So now we have uh, somewhere about 260 million Americans have access to medical cannabis. And uh, in the UK, no one has access to medical cannabis except through this rather strange extract of, uh, called Sativex. Now America hasn't ended, the world, the, the California and New York haven't disintegrated into anarchy as a result of medical cannabis. And one of the reasons they haven't is because Obama said we, to the DEA, the Drug Enforcement Agency, you will not try to stop the sale of medicinal cannabis. Because they wanted to do that. There's a huge organization of enforcers uh, who wanted to stop medical cannabis in the States. And Obama said we will not impose the federal regulations on the states. And that, so that was a landmark statement, and, uh, and we should, I think, take a lot of, um, be very grateful to him for doing that. And one of the reasons I think we can be relaxed about uh, making cannabis available, at least as a medicine, is that when you look at the, the range of harms that drugs do, if you look at the 16 different ways in which drugs can harm you, they can harm you, they can harm society. This very systematic analysis that I, me and my team did a few years ago, it turns out that cannabis is sort of in the middle of the most harmful drugs. Alcohol, far and away the most harmful. The reason for the harms of alcohol are, is the scale of the red bar. The red bar are the harms that this drug, alcohol, does to society. And you can see that um, cannabis has considerably less harms to society. Uh, and, and also the size of the blue bar are the harms to the user and less harms to the user. So there is no logical reason, if you consider the harms of drugs, why cannabis should be illegal at all. And there's certainly no reason why it shouldn't be made available as a medicine. Because it was a medicine. It was a medicine in the UK and presumably here until 1971. And it had been a medicine for about 4,000 years. But then in 1971, the Labour government decided it was going to show it was hard on drugs and when two GPs were campaigning for recreational cannabis to be made available in the UK, and they were prescribing medical cannabis 
and telling people to use it recreationally. The government decided to show it was really strong on drugs. So instead of just uh, striking off the doctors, as they did, they decided to ban the drug. I mean, a, a remarkable thing, really, because they did it without consulting doctors. They just said, it is no longer a medicine because we want to stop people using it recreationally. Now, of course, that was a, a completely ridiculous thing to do, and it hasn't worked in terms of recreational use, but it has worked to stop medical use. And I find this, that this the position on, uh, and the attitude that people have taken to cannabis is completely absurd because you go back 100 years and there's Queen Victoria, the most powerful woman in the world at the time, probably the most powerful woman there's ever been in the history of the world. And she used cannabis on a regular basis. She used it for period pains. She used it for the pains of childbirth and recovery from childbirth. And sometimes in my more mischievous moments, I think she probably used it at other times, and that's why she had so many children, but I'm not sure about that. <laughs> And as far as I know, she was never busted. So, you know, we, we have an absurd situation where, you know, it can be used as a medicine safely, essentially across the whole uh, economic and uh, spectrum uh, then, but not now. And there's been campaigns over many decades to try to reverse that rather absurd decision. And in 2001, the House of Lords uh, wrote a report which is a really extremely good comprehensive overview of the benefits of cannabis and the harms of cannabis, uh, particularly in relation to medicine. And they said in that report, we're pleased that the Home Office is showing the first signs of adopting a genuinely pragmatic and expeditious approach to the issue of cannabis-based medicines. And they also said it's undesirable to prosecute genuine therapeutic users of cannabis who possess or grow cannabis for their own use. And at that time, the government said, yeah, that's yeah, actually good. Yeah, we, we, we will do something about this report. But in typical political fashion, they changed their mind as soon as it suited them. And we then developed uh, a campaign to go in the opposite direction, to magnify uh, the penalties for cannabis possession. So there's Alan Johnson, the man that sacked me. You can see me in the spliff with the other scientists who resigned at the same time. Because cannabis is such a convenient political tool that the needs of patients are completely overlooked or subserved to the benefits of these politicians. Because this is how we wage the war in cannabis in the UK today. Here's an example. I get many emails like this on a regular basis. She's a teacher in her 50s. She's in wheel -bound, a wheelchair bound with multiple sclerosis. And three times in the last couple of years, the police have launched dawn raids on her house, smashed her door down, to find her in possession of cannabis. Now, she's in a wheelchair, she's not going to jump out the window. They could knock on the door and, and she'd let them in. But of course, the war on drugs empowers the police. It, it justifies ex this kind of paramilitary behavior, which they enjoy. They get extra overtime as well. They get to dress up in these big outfits and uh, put their heads, and, and they enjoy it in some ways. But it's a truly, it's an absurd situation to be in because if they do it again, she must go to prison. <coughs> the fourth strike uh, for a, a cannabis offence requires imprisonment, which would be abs completely absurd for someone in a wheelchair and also extremely costly. And I think Queen Victoria would not have approved of this behaviour. Sadly, her lookalike Theresa May seems to. <laughs> and what we've seen over the last 10 years is a deliberate ploy of um, incentivizing the police to prosecute people for cannabis. And this was initiated by uh, the Home Secretary, John Reid, and perpetuated by Jackie Smith and, uh, and also by Alan Johnson. And you see here, if you incentivize the police, they will do what you ask them to do. Um, and they, they progressively arrested more and more people for cannabis possession. And now we have a million young people in Britain with criminal records for cannabis possession. It's an extremely racist policy because it's massively overrepresented in terms of Afro-Caribbeans and other ethnic groups. We've created an underclass of people who cannot get jobs in any kind of government uh, employment. And therefore, what do they do? Well, they do crime because once you can't get work, crime is, uh, and particularly drug crime is all you can do. And the London riots in 2012 were 
in part a response to a further crackdown by the new police commissioner. And this is truly outrageous. We spend half a billion pounds a year in Britain criminalising young black men for possessing a spliff. Half a billion pounds. I mean, that money should be much, much better spent. And we did one other thing, and I'm interested in, in if there are any lawyers in the audience, because this is something that might not have happened in Guernsey. But in, the, in England, we have a thing called the medical defence. You are allowed to plead in your defence for possessing a drug that you, had to, you were using it because nothing else helped you. And this is a defence that uh, goes back to the beginnings of time, in the beginnings of the British legal system, hundreds of years. But in 2005, the law lords decided that for cannabis, and only for cannabis, that defence was no longer available. So they took away this common law right of people to say, I'm using this drug because nothing else helps my illness. You can still plead that you use crystal meth to help your headaches, or you use <laughs> psilocybin to help your headaches. Uh, but you can't say you, you, that you were using cannabis to you treat your multiple sclerosis or your spasticity or whatever. And magistrates hate it because everyone that's brought to them for possessing cannabis must be convicted. And in fact, we also now have this Proceeds of Crime Act where they can freeze your assets and easily take your assets and the assets of the people who you live with uh, on the grounds that they are drug dealers. And the law lords that put that, or retracted that, century-old defence of necessity were Lords Bingham, Carswell and Roger. And the reason they did it was because the government was irritated by people using the defence. And they said, well, the government saw the House of Lords report, they failed to act on it, therefore we don't believe that this uh, defence should be available. And you can read about it. I think that is truly the most obnoxious uh, law that we've ever made. And what's even worse about it is that one of the law lords was Bingham. When he was made a law lord, he was asked this question by uh, Boris Johnson, who was the editor of The Spectator at the time. So you would legalise cannabis? And Bingham said in 2002, absolutely. It's stupid having a law which isn't doing what it's there for. And then within three years, he's gone from wanting cannabis legalised to banning the use of it, even for people for whom it's the only viable medical opportunity, and that is outrageous. And it's, really, it's an insult to all of us who actually pay our taxes and, and support this, this kind of judiciary. And we see this logic, uh, this dishonesty logic cycle with cannabis and with other drugs. But essentially, when cannabis became banned, it was put into Schedule 1, which makes research almost impossible. Only three hospitals in Britain, maybe four now, have a license to hold a a Schedule One drug. So, so you can't research cannabis, so then you don't find any health benefits. So people say, well, there are no health benefits. And therefore, there are no health benefits, but there are harms. And so the ban stays. So we've, kind of, we've created this, uh, this, this evidential uh, flaw uh, which perpetuates the, 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 the bad law in the first place. But we've done worse than that. The banning of cannabis has actually changed the whole nature of cannabis production. And as you probably know, cannabis, when it was traditionally grown as, as, a, as, a, as hash uh, or resin, was a mixture of uh, the active stoning ingredient, which is delta-9 THC, and cannabidiol, which is a, uh, a kind of antidote. It has a, it's different actions. It's more anxiolytic and more relaxant, maybe antipsychotic, uh, may even be anti-cancer. So we have these two components which kind of balance each other out. At least cannabidiol mitigates some of the more extreme effects of delta-9 THC. <clears throat> but prohibiting cannabis has meant that cannabidiol has disappeared. And now most cannabis is almost all THC. And strong THC cannabis is often called skunk. And, uh, and, and therefore we don't have the, the balancing out component. And we've also seen something possibly even worse. We've seen attempts to get around the law. Sensible people say, well, why would I, I don't want to be convicted for possessing cannabis, so can I find an alternative? And there are hundreds of thousands of alternatives, potential alternatives, which are synthetic cannabinoids. They were made in the 1970s as treatments uh, for cancer, for, for cancer nausea, and possibly for pain. They were discarded by the drug companies back in the 70s and 80s because they, were, they, were, they had far too many side effects. 
But they've now been resurrected by uh, uh, independent chemists, largely in China and India, and they're being widely sold as spice. They're sprayed onto herbs and smoked like cannabis, but no one really knows what they are. They can be extremely toxic. They can cause seizures and psychosis. And so we've created this monster of spice uh, by banning ordinary, traditional cannabis. Here you see the data in the UK showing that 2002, about 30% of uh, cannabis seizures in Britain were very high THC, no cannabidiol, and now it's about 80%. So the clampdown has actually distorted the market. Uh, we know that people who smoke stunk, skunk without cannabidiol have a greater experience of psychotic symptoms. Here's a study from Celia Morgan and Val Curran showing that uh, this is the first real evidence that high-strength THC is, uh, can add to the burden of psychotic illness, whereas the, the mixture doesn't. So we've created this monster by trying to stop people using cannabis. And this is the even bigger monster, this massive increase of seizures of spice in Europe. And I can tell you, 1.6 tonnes of spice is equivalent to about a billion doses. So Europe is essentially saturated now with spice. It's been estimated in some of our prisons, 75% of prisoners are using spice on a daily basis. And it's creating severe trouble because some of the behaviour disturbances are extremely profound and very damaging and disturbing. And none of this was necessary. This is all a consequence of intense attempts to prohibit a drug that's less harmful than alcohol. Well, I want to tell you about some attempts we've made in the UK to change the law. Uh, this is a, an article I wrote a few months ago in the Pharmaceutical Journal uh, arguing the case for bringing back medical cannabis to the status of it was in 1971. And I'm very pleased to say that, that the recent annual congress of the Royal Pharmaceutical Society, they had a debate and there was a very strong vote in favour of, of reinstigating cannabis to the pharmacopoeia. So a campaign has started in the UK but currently the debate is all about politics. We cannot engage the politicians in the medical debate. Which is a pity because change is very, very easy. Our law and your law is I think almost identical is that all we have to do is reschedule cannabis. We have to say, uh, we made a mistake in 1971. It actually should have stayed as a Schedule II drug. Schedule II drugs are drugs like heroin and cocaine. Uh, they're treated more uh, as less harmful under our laws than cannabis. So we could simply say cannabis actually is a Schedule II drug, and that would allow doctors to prescribe it. The Home Secretary can do that. We don't even need a debate in Parliament. She can just say there's enough evidence of medical use to reschedule it. And then if it was available, it would be made, uh, if it was rescheduled, it would be made available to, to pharmacists. And there are medical suppliers already in countries like the Netherlands. We'd have to re-educate doctors, but I think most doctors would be very interested in being re-educated because they know the limitations of many of the current medications for pain and spasticity. And the reason I'm particularly pleased to be here is that I can see opportunities in Guernsey. So you're a separate jurisdiction you have a, uh, a more, or you have an opportunity at least to make your own minds up about drugs. You, you have in the past uh, done things differently to a small extent uh, compared with the UK and it would be completely within your rights to make cannabis the medicine on Guernsey. And that would then open up an opportunity for at least 50,000 UK patients to avail themselves of medical cannabis here. And also there'll be a few locals as well who probably like that. And, uh, and you would, I think, make a huge amount of money for medical tourism because people would come here to get treated for their disorders. And I think it would be a, an enormous benefit to your economy. You could also do medical research because, as I say, there's almost no medical research on typical traditional medicinal cannabis in the UK. And actually it would also be good for your society because it would be more just and more humane. And I guess that's the whole purpose of Dandelion, isn't it? 